Stockholm. Streets and places named to recognize greatness. Or perhaps to acknowledge it was not fully appreciated when it was alive, when it was still available. A tiny street, a tiny square named after him. The location matters more than the size of the plaza, the length of the street. Next to the Royal Theater, Bergman's true love, films were only lovers. A short subway ride away is his other professional home. What is left of it? Here too signs remind us of past greatness. Here, once the center of the Swedish film industry, Bergman makes some of his films. Over 400 films were made here. Svensk film industry left the area in 1969. Last film was made here in 1999. The silence present today is different from the silence a director calls before action. Many of the scenes from the film Seventh Seal were filmed here. Today, stars of their own social media sites have plenty of places to take selfies here. The square next to Rocket Bar is named after Bergman. Here too, he dominates space. Some of Sweden's international stars, the few from Nordic countries that made it to Hollywood during the Golden Age, are remembered here. Ingmar's presence hangs over them, like it hangs over everything else. Once Stanley Kubrick sent him a letter, it is not known if he answered. Film locations and Second World War battlefields have become places to visit during holidays. A place as a cave painting, speaking to each visitor differently, but still allowing to become part of something communal. In a world filled with tribal bubbles and shouting, yesterday's grand narratives offer the safety wrapped in nostalgia. Cinema as a church. Air, land, and sea. A direct flight from Helsinki to Visby, then a bus ride to the other end of the islands. Bergman made two documentaries about the islands and the people here. Why the third one he mentions in the second one was never made, I do not know.
Bergman has become a bus stop. A tiny museum called Grandly, the Berkman Center, keeps his memory alive here. There is no doubt that the locals would remember him otherwise, too. Garbo in New York, Salinger in New Hampshire. I've come here also to see a statue, the Oscar that, as Berkman confirmed, belongs to Jörn Donner. Donner made the film Fanny and Alexander possible. He made it happen. The Berkman Center inquired from Donner about getting the Oscar to the museum but understandably, he declined. After Donner's death, his widow brings it here. Rumor has it, she paid the trip herself. Donner felt he never received any apology from Sweden. Many were against Fanny and Alexander. After success, many were to claim it even demands to give the Oscar to the Film Institute were made. Bergman put a stop to these. According to him, Jörn had every right for it. Donner did not receive royalties from the film. Today, the film still continues to make money, and for many is the first path to Bergman even to Sweden. Ingmar and Jörn as a schoolboy, Donner visits Stockholm from Finland and sees one of Berkman's films. A few years later, he's present as a young film critic in Helsinki in a press conference Berkman gives with Harriet Anderson. Later, Harriet and Jörn become a couple. Donner writes one of the first books on Bergman. After Ingmar's death, he writes another. He makes multiple documentaries about Bergman, directs his own films, writes countless of books, fact and fiction. For a while, Donner is one of the most recognizable faces in Sweden, in Finland, his whole adult life. Donner makes sure never to give his whole hand to the crocodile as he describes his relationship with Berkman. He knows he is appreciated by Ingmar, especially when he can make films happen. Working for the Swedish Film Institute, first under Harry Schein and then as the head of the Institute, Donner plays a key role in Bergman's path to international fame, while making other Swedish films and his own films too, known abroad. It helps when you have a superstar like Bergman to sell. Schein teases Donner frequently, telling him Donner will never be another Bergman. Shine is originally from Austria. Two foreigners, Donner and Shine, useful for Sweden for a while. Do the names Shine and Donner ring a bell at all in today's Sweden or abroad? 
the last documentary film Donner directs is about Bergman. A map guides visitors to Berkman's final resting place, the graveyard located close to the Berkman Center. Once Donner gives a speech here, as the church plays a part in the weeks celebrating Berkman's work. Thoughtfully, Berkman requested the grave to be a bit further away from others. Here, too, he commands the space. Visitors will not disturb others, and perhaps the other dead don't disturb Bergman, who is buried with his wife. Opposite the graveyard, a gas station. Nearby, a graveyard of vehicles waiting to be brought back to life. I continue to explore the island. A straight line from here to there, calmness and quiet.
Bergman's house is guarded and fenced off. Here signs tell to stay away. A place of pilgrimage for international artists and filmmakers. A residency. Applications considered from all over the world. I'll let the house have its privacy and try to find a tree. The one that Donner captured in his documentary Life and Work, Celebrating Bergman. He spent a few days interviewing Bergman. Donner edits the film the way he wants it. Bergman is not happy, but once the film is received very well, opinions can change. Here the vastness of the horizon clears your mind. A Hemingway-esque sea, old man and the sea. Ingmar playing his part, walking along the beach. No more. Perhaps the wind continues to whisper something. There is a certain irony that today the former home of Bergman is guarded and fenced off, protected, considering the official Sweden with its tax officials only achieved driving Bergman to leave Sweden and relocate to Germany. He had been there before as an exchange student in 1936. The young Bergman goes and hears Hitler speak in an event. When he leaves Sweden, Bergman tells how he has embraced the grey ideology of compromise, as he now calls social democracy that has come after him. He realizes that in Sweden bureaucrats can come after anyone, anywhere, anytime. Suddenly the fact that Harry Schein plays tennis weekly with Prime Minister Olaf Palme seems little of use. Bergman's plans to build film studios to the islands are put on hold, cancelled. In Germany, Donner will read the script for Fanny and Alexander. He demands it will have to be made in Sweden and in Swedish. Further away from Berkman's house, a short drive, are farm buildings. One of them hides inside Berkman's private cinema. A copy of every film distributed in Sweden was made available to Berkman. Your own cinema on an island. What else would you need? Every day except Sunday, Berkman would watch a film here. First at 3 p.m., then at 8 p.m six days a week, from May to October, for 30 years. Since then, many expressed their shock when Hollywood action, Die Hard and others are found from his VHS collection, 
the idea of an artist by those who wish to identify as his colleagues can be very narrow. Next to Holiday Resort's parking lot stands a memorial for Sweden's murdered Prime Minister, Olof Palme. Palme spent 30 summers on the island. The local Social Democrats wanted to honor his memory. The design of the memorial is inspired by Palme's international work. Nearby is a phone booth from which, according to the locals, Palme ruled Sweden. Faces in a crowd, Donner and Bergman together listening Palme in an event. The Suter Sand Resort is one of the most visited in Sweden. The early mornings are calm. I get the beach to myself and my thoughts. Jörn Donner wrote two books about Sweden and made a documentary film where he traveled across the country. At the start of his career, he was the youngest film critic for Dagens Nyheter, chosen by Olof Lagergrans. Names of giants of a Sweden that has since changed. In 2001, Donner writes in a book Vort behuva Olof to Lagergrans how his latest book has not been taken up for publication in Sweden. A cry for help of sorts, how times are changing. Although his books would then still continue to be published in Sweden. In Swedish television, Jörn Donner interviews Muhammad Ali, and as a regular guest, or host of talk shows, talk so directly and without a filter that Swedes are in shock. It's the Finn again, as they say. Once he becomes the head of the Film Institute, more headlines will follow. By the 1970s, Ingmar Bergman who once in the 1950s was directing soap commercials, is bringing out one masterpiece after another. Ingmar lives on the island from 1967 onwards. His house is ready on Midsummer's Eve. In 2003, he sells his apartment in Stockholm. He has nine children. Donner will have five sons and one daughter. Men so obsessed with themselves and creativity that something must be left behind in all possible forms. From movies to books to offsprings. The waves of the sea clear the footsteps from the beach.
attractor make sure tourists and holiday makers will have the beach without a trace of others. When I tell people I am going to visit Berkman's Island, it leads to an influx of memories and thoughts from them. Bergman is personal for everyone. An Italian composer tells me that Bergman mainly meant two things for him when he first discovered him. Being raised in a Catholic country, he was immediately attracted by his exploration of God's silence and all the contradictions of the Christian image of God and the fact that he was able to do it with so few means, just two characters and a camera. He goes on to tell that when he discovered him, he didn't have the means to grasp the psychological aspects of the characters and the dialogue but now he feels he can appreciate Batiman's films even more. What links to now and then is the memory of an experience. He tells me how he went to watch Fanny and Alexander in a cinema where you could make a card, a special ticket, eight movies for 8,000 liras. Today it would be more or less eight films for eight euros. He watched countless classics there, in that cinema. When the screening of Fanny and Alexander started, he also started to feel a rise in temperature. Fever. But he did not feel dizzy or bad, it was just a pleasant warmness. He sees all the Christmas scenes and then the rest of the film with this gauzy sensation. an experience he can still remember. He goes on to tell me that a few years ago he saw scenes from a marriage for the first time. He says, I'm happy I didn't do it before because now I could understand everything. Whatever the characters did made sense. And on the fourth episode, I was completely flabbergasted. I thought, how did he bring me here? Bring me to the point that I can understand why he slaps her and feel his anger as if I was angry. And I can understand her reaction and feel humiliated like she does now. After the Italian composer's thoughts, I receive an email from Los Angeles, from Burbank, wishing me a good trip. A producer tells that he first came across the name and films of Ingmar Bergman during the 1983 Academy Awards, when arguably one of his masterpieces, Fanny and Alexander, was nominated for six Oscars and won four including Best Foreign Language Film. For him, it was the first Swedish film he had ever seen, exposing him to this unique depiction of the country. And the film made him want to see more of the master filmmaker's work, especially since the film was supposed to be his final film. He writes how he took the deep dive and discovered more of Bergman's brilliant work, including Face to Face starring Liv Ullman, his partner and muse. What struck him about his films was how he examined morality issues through an exploration of human relationships with other and with God. 
Bergman's films also introduced him to Swedish cinema on a broader scale. For the producer in Burbank, like many other fans, this total filmmaker remains Sweden's greatest filmmaker. I check one more email before I put my phone away. A history teacher that I have stayed in touch with tells how he discovered Bergman's films during his school days. He rarely went to the movies, but a teacher of religion and psychology, who was also a politician and the mastermind behind many projects, arranged for the students to see Bergman's Wild Strawberries. It made a big impression. His teacher talked about it as a psychological film. Now, my teacher tells how he was quite young to understand the movie at the time, but it hasn't stopped being interesting to him. He adds that although it's a film about old age and the closeness of death, he feels it reflects on basic existential questions. Where we come from. Where we are with our complicated relationships. And where we are going. Wondering if anything in life had meaning is the most important content of the film for him. And after all these years, still feels significant. Later, he sees Bergman's other films. He gets several DVDs of his movies. One of his other favorites was The Seventh Seal. He shows it to his students. In his opinion, Bergman used medieval church paintings and the stories he related to them in an impressive way. It was a glimpse into a time when spirits and their powers were perceived as real, and hell as a geographical place. The scene, death playing chess with the night, is downright terrifying. For the teacher, in Bergman, his own main interests are in the basic questions of life. Whether life has meaning, and whether we find some kind of reconciliation with ourselves during our lifetime. A truth that sustains us. In more general terms, he sees Bergman in Sweden as quite the critic of the bourgeois Sweden, whose autobiographical works and films dealing with the contradictions of his own life are the antidote to the perceived safety and security of Sweden. He ponders if this perhaps explains part of his popularity. Or would there be a simpler explanation? He sums up that Bergman was a skilled writer and a film director who surrounded himself with actors of the highest quality. In all his self-centeredness, he was an artist to admire. Name my 
The road leads back to the church. I drink one more raspberry lemonade at the Berkman Center. Buy some books. There is still no bridge between the islands, something that was talked about already before Bergman made his island documentaries. The conversation continues. I walk around Bispu. Fortifications and walls, towers standing like works of art, part of cultural history today. Battles are staged to relive history. Around Vispu, the name Donner comes across frequently. Jern's family originated from Lübeck, as did Greta Donner's husband. Today, her building serves as a tourist info. When Greta became a widow in 1751, at the age of 25, she continued what they had started together with her husband and created a merchant fleet with 20 ships. An empire of import and export with Germany and Great Britain. I speak with a Danish scriptwriter. She shares her thoughts on Berkman, a figure in the history of cinema, a giant who did some amazing work. For her too, Fanny and Alexander is the one that comes to mind at once. But she also adds that for her, Bergman is also an example of the image, the idea of a male genius, and how they could behave, and how that behavior was accepted, even envied, and justified with the art they created. Bergman made her consider and reconsider what it is we call geniuses, particularly the men of cinema. What makes or justifies a genius should be thought over. I think about this as I think about the three, shall we say, original men with moments of genius. Bergman, Donner, Schein. For a long time, going to visit Bergman on the island would have required a special permit from the officials. The islands were imported to the military. Today, on the other side of the sea, Kaliningrad is still there, as are the Russians. Suddenly, the Swedes have woken up again to the reality surrounding the Baltic Sea. In Stockholm stands the film who said, Harry Shine's Empire. Which Jörn Donner took over. Donner writes a letter why he should not be chosen and why he's not the right person to run the film institute. He becomes the director after Shine for a while. They both smoke like alcohol, publish books, 
and experienced the Second World War as children. Shine's mother sent him to safety to Sweden as she disappears forever into the concentration camps. Donner relocates to the countryside as Russian bombs start to hit Helsinki. Later, Shine hopes to come Sweden's consul to Los Angeles, but it does not happen. Donner becomes one for Finland in Los Angeles for a while before running and being elected to the European Parliament. On the wall of the film house is a quote from Shine, reminding that the place is not just any house. Some of the women in Donner's life say to him that he always leaves a back door open to leave, to escape. When accusations start to fly regarding the production and budget of Fanny and Alexander, Donner has enough for Sweden. He has always divided his time between Finland and Sweden, often catching a flight to Helsinki after the working day, but now he will relocate to Finland for good. When a politician asks who should run the Finnish film fund, he suggests himself. He is chosen. The building of the film fund is renovated from an old warehouse, an appropriate choice and size considering the state of the Finnish film industry and films when compared to Sweden. Here too, Donner will initiate a filmography project, as he did in Sweden. Donner often says that without Bergman, he would have been a different person. In his last film about Bergman, Donner tells that Ingmar ends their final phone call with the words, Wir bleiben. Bergman, Donner, Schein. Many look up to these giants, many criticize. Few could compete or last a moment in the same room. <laughs>